Hello and welcome. You are listening to an informed take on current events brought to you by law students and staff of Queen's University Belfast. This is LawPod. Hello and welcome to LawPod. My name is Claire Patton. I'm a lecturer in the School of Law and we're joined today in conversation with Kira Hackett and Kieran O'Kelly and we research in the sphere of business and human rights. We're going to talk today about the intersection between human rights, business and the World Cup. Hi Kira. Hi Claire, how are you? Not too bad. Hi Kieran. Hi Claire, how are you? Grand. Okay, so who wants to kick off this conversation? Uh, I think myself and Kieran are both looking at Kira here, so so it's obviously me then. Uh-huh. Um, I suppose whenever you think about World Cup, you are thinking about controversial issues such as doping. So in the current situation, we have the Peruvian player who, despite a ban for doping, was cleared to play in the. Um, Peru's first World Cup in 36 years but as well as that you've issues such as concussion um, and the head injury assessments the most recent example being Morocco um, in the Iran game initially and then playing um, Amrabat again in the Portuguese game which was five days after the concussion um, where protocol states you must wait six days um, but perhaps moving more interestingly to what we want to talk about today has been the case of sanctions um, in the case of the Mexican captain Rafael Marquez, who has experienced individual sanctions on allegations of money laundering and drugs trafficking, or even the Iranian football team, who have experienced the fallout from President Trump pulling out of the nuclear deal with Iran, which has meant that, for example, Nike has had to withdraw their supplies of football boots to the Iranian teams. So whereas we do think that these are very important and certainly sport lawyers out there will will definitely see the interest in that, as a group we are more interested in the role of businesses and the World Cup. And specifically we're talking about the role of business in respecting and protecting the human rights of workers, stakeholders and communities in the life cycle of a World Cup. So from the bidding process all the way through to the legacy of the World Cup in a local community. And then, Kieran, that maybe probably brings in some of the things that you were thinking about with regard to FIFA. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I think is quite interesting when we think about uh, FIFA is first to think about FIFA as, at least in terms of how it talks about human rights, how it talks about its position in human rights, that it's playing quite a traditional um, business role in terms of how businesses have articulated corporate social responsibility and especially how they've they've talked about um, human rights. So the way I see FIFA uh, at the moment is that it's um, an organisation sitting pretty much in the middle of a supply chain. Uh, it's procuring uh, World Cup infrastructure and events from a certain kind of supplier, in this case a nation state, um, and then it's delivering services uh, to sponsors, uh, TV companies, maybe services um, that we could say are reputational to sponsors, um, and entertainment services to TV companies and ultimately um, to ourselves. So uh, so it's it's quite interesting. And, and, and kind of going on from that, um, FIFA is, I think for all those of us who read in the space, um, very typically conflicted in terms of its position in uh, in a supply chain. Business and human rights is not easy. It's not easy for any supplier, for any procurer of goods and services. Uh, once, um, well, we know there's a lot of controversy around the um, uh, awarding of the World Cup to Russia and to Qatar, um, but once the award has been given um, and uh, Russia or Qatar, in this case, are to supply a World Cup, FIFA is actually in a relatively um, weak position, uh, the biggest priority for them is to ensure that the World Cup happens. Do they have a plan B? Well, plan B, if they had one, would be very, very difficult to implement um, in terms of getting another uh, country to supply a World Cup. So they're in a weak bargaining position when it comes to um, human rights, because the most important thing for them is uh, schedule. And at the same time, um, they're in an interesting position, at least vis-a-vis sponsors. So one of the consequences we can see of um, the World Cup being awarded to Russia and Qatar and the controversy around that, the controversy around uh, corruption is that some sponsors have stepped away 
and we see new sponsors coming in, um, uh, maybe also perhaps reflecting the rebalancing of global capitalism. So Qatar Airways and Gazprom uh, are acting as partners for uh, FIFA, as are um, a couple of um, Chinese corporate giants, the, the Wander Group, which is a property development giant, and Mengnu, uh, which is um, a large dairy company that itself 10 years ago was involved in a pretty massive scandal in, uh, in China to do with tainted um, milk products being sold. And as a result, has become a kind of at the forefront of corporate social responsibility in China as it's tried to get its reputation back. Of course, what are sponsors interested in? I mean, Claire, you'll know more than me about this. They're interested in reputation, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's what I suppose just um, almost circling back for me whenever I think about my own um, sphere of research, it, it is... Um, it centres around or centres on um, reputation, corporate social responsibility, uh, marketing and essentially how a corporation is projecting its image to its stakeholders. Um, and so I suppose um, whenever I'm looking at the World Cup and the concerns that I have, I'm thinking about the about the sponsorships and where they sit in what we would think of as, as these supply chains and the impact that they can have. So, Kieran, whenever you were saying before that that you see FIFA as sitting in the middle almost of a supply chain, I think that that's really interesting and it, it, it isn't how I had actually thought about it before. So, um, I suppose whenever we think of the more traditional supply chains um, here, uh, what I, I picked up on would be the two main um, sports sponsors for the kits would be uh, Nike and Adidas. So Nike and Adidas sponsor 89% of the kits um, that are used at the World Cup. Um, they're the two two biggest sports manufacturers um, in the world and their profits have been increasing year on year. Um, obviously, it's a very competitive market and whenever we're looking at the figures that these two corporations are paying <clears throat> for uh, paying out to to sports players, um, whenever we look at Messi and Ronaldo, the lifetime deals um, that those two players alone are worth. Um, so these companies, obviously, whenever they're paying out the, the big money in sponsorship deals at one end and you're tracing through the supply chain and looking at where is it that they're saving money and where is it that they're making money, spending money. Um, and what's of interest is despite these two companies both um, listing corporate social responsibility as being one of their main um, concerns and listing it very highly on their websites and they do indeed comply with, with different corporate reporting, social corporate reporting, etc. Um, whenever you look through the supply chain to their suppliers, we can see that there is a trend in where they ha whereby they have moved their operations from China, which is where they had been based um, for quite a while due to the low production costs and they've actually moved their production from China um, to other Asian countries such as Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, um, I think Indonesia, um, where they've been able to drive down the production costs even further. Um, this is a really important uh, topic for us to discuss whenever we're talking about the World Cup because um, the gulf between the workers who are actually sewing these kits, so this is mostly women, um, the gulf between their working conditions, their pay and their lives um, compared to, uh, you know, the Ronaldos and the Messis. And I don't want to keep um, maybe focusing on two particular players. There's lots and lots of players. There's lots of clubs um, who benefit from from the sponsorship, the big, big sponsorship deals. Um, but we will, I, I will actually link um, to some of the reports um, whenever this show goes out where the, the listeners can read themselves of this disparity where I think it, it's something like... Um, what Ronaldo earns in one day, a, a normal European worker, an average European worker would earn in six years. So you can imagine the disparity again, whenever we're looking at the at the mostly women um, who are involved in, in um, sewing the kits. And so it really comes down to um, accountability and visibility and what we can do um, as as individuals who follow the World Cup, who are interested in the World Cup, what we can do to hold these companies accountable, what um, regulations exist at, at the moment um, that can help with this accountability, what we can do as customers, consumers and stakeholders. So Kieran, just on that point, um, could you maybe talk us through some of the main regulatory instruments that do exist? Yeah, um, 
I suppose the, the main uh, instrument is the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Uh, I mean, what's interesting uh, about them, I think, primarily is that they've existed for a lifetime. You know, they, they were first brought into being in 1976. Really, if you see them as uh, arriving at a point where uh, global capitalism is going through its, its new revolution in terms of supply chains, um, and in terms of flows of capital, we get a kind of, uh, on the one hand, a liberalisation of trade and um, of uh, of capital uh, worldwide. And at the same time, we get um, an attempt to consolidate expectations about how enterprises ought to conduct themselves, especially if you have a home state enterprise in an OECD country. How does it conduct itself uh, um, in host states? And the OECD guidelines have been uh, interesting as well because they've been quite flexible. If you look at the different iterations, they've been rewritten every few years. Uh, 1976, they're brought into being, then 1979 onwards through the 80s and 90s and 2000s, and most recently, kind of 2011. And they've brought in and borrowed off the language of instruments in their surroundings. So, for instance, on labour conditions, which, of course, are very important to FIFA, um, uh, the ILO has uh, guidelines, and these were the language of them was incorporated into the OECD guidelines. And more recently, innovations around business and human rights at the United Nations level have become um, uh, have been drawn into the um, the OECD guidelines. I don't know, Kira, do you want to? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so as a group, we have done a little bit of work on the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And basically, they have taken um, the next step, uh, so built on the OECD guiding uh, the guidelines for multinational um, enterprises. And really it reflects how as capitalism and corporations have become more and more complex um, and powerful, there has been a greater need to engage um, with businesses and governments in a way to protect and respect human rights going forward. So from that then you have the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. They sit on three pillars and there's three main duties there. There is the state duty to protect human rights there's the corporate responsibility to respect human rights and there is a right to a remedy where there has been a human rights violation or a human rights impact to use the language of the guiding principles. And what's interesting about this is the first time that you have this soft law principle which has come together between business and um, states where there has been a consensus in terms of the language used and the aims and objectives of the principles. And that's something that feeds on through um, with FIFA. If you look at the advisory reports that FIFA have produced most recently in May and November 2017, you see that they are actually using this language of the United Nations guiding principles in their advisory reports. Um, they reference the UN guiding principles and they say that FIFA will be endeavouring to embed these principles into their operations and their respect for human rights. But there's a little bit of difference. So the guiding principles sit on three pillars. So the state duty to protect, the corporate responsibility to respect and the right to remedy. The um, advisory report outlines a four pillared approach. First of all, to commit and embed human rights protections at an operational level, to identify and address adverse human rights impacts and to protect and remedy. But this protection seems to be particularly as it relates to the media and to human rights defenders. And interestingly, they don't actually give a definition on what a human rights defender is, which is a bit of a problem um, in academic circles more generally. And finally then, um, to engage and communicate, which seems to be very much linked with the due diligence um, mechanism. Now, this in itself is quite interesting because even though FIFA is not a um, corporation in itself, it's a not-for-profit private organisation, they are responding to the UN guiding principles as a corporate form. So they are showing a type of leadership there. And secondly, secondly and in committing to the language of the guiding principles, they're recognising this need to provide remedy in cases where there is or has been a human rights violation. But in saying all that, it does seem to be very much um, making conversation and raising awareness as opposed to doing any real positive impact. So, Claire, maybe you could talk a bit about um, some of the issues that have befallen FIFA in the drive for World Cups, particularly in Russia and Qatar, particularly as they relate maybe to labour conditions or um, 
workers' rights. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kira. Um, I think that one of the things that um, was quite interesting whenever you were talking um, about the United Nations guiding principles there, whenever you spoke about soft law. So what we're essentially saying here is that um, they're not legally binding. Um, so whenever we're talking, uh, so uh, just to go back to the United Nations guiding principles, um, it, it, this is essentially 31 principles that make up the international standard to help prevent and address adverse human rights impact associated with business activities. Um, and whenever um, we're looking at, as I was speaking um, before about the sponsorship um, and the issues, the human rights um, issues that we have associated with um, some of the sponsors in their supply chains, um, th you know, that's obviously one one human rights issue and then another one which um, you had just said there Kira, about the labour conditions of the mostly migrant workers um, who have been involved in building the stadiums um, and again you know these are really severe breaches of human rights um, people have died in the construction of, of these stadiums so in um, in Russia, uh, there were there have been 21 reported deaths, and in Qatar, there were 10 reported deaths um, of construction workers. So we've got um, almost an inverse. We have extreme heat in Qatar and then extreme cold in Russia, um, and the protections. Um, that should be in place to protect these workers simply aren't enforced. Um, whenever Human Rights Watch would be an organisation that do a lot of work um, in investigating the abuses that are associated and linked to FIFA and to the World Cups um, and they have tried to carry out um, investigations. They have published reports which again that we, we will link um, to listeners for listeners if they're interested um, but they've had awful problems trying to access the sites in Qatar mm -hmm. um, so really, I suppose we need to look to the value of of the different um, instruments that currently exist to protect um, different individuals who are susceptible to human rights abuses associated with the World Cup, be that the construction workers or be that the um, the women who are sewing the um, the kits, etc. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think that that's what what the conversation needs to centre on. Kira. Yeah, and I think that that raises something very interesting because tra traditionally when you had been bidding for a World Cup, um, countries typically seem to be more motivated to comply with international human rights obligations. And some of this, in theory, was due to the requirements of the bidding process. But aside from that, it was to build up international support on the world stage. But in terms of Qatar and Russia, this need for international support in terms of international human rights um, obligations seems to be less of a motivation and it seems to be more a sense of national pride that they're in a position to host such a prestigious event. So Claire, you had mentioned there about the labour conditions in Russia and Qatar um, but in addition to that there is the status of these workers as migrant workers. Um, so particularly maybe in Qatar you have this system called the Kafala system and basically what the kafala system is, is that there's an employer who arranges for workers to come to Qatar and is responsible for them during their stay in Qatar and during their working practice in Qatar. Now, this employer can and has been known to, according to Human Rights Watch and the Business and Human Rights Resource Centre, which is a very useful resource for anybody interested in this area. They would say that there's been instances where these migrant workers have had their passports seized. They haven't been able to leave their jobs, they haven't been able to leave the country. And this contravenes the International Convention on the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Their Families. Now, in saying that, this um, convention has neither been signed nor ratified by either Qatar or Russia. Now, that doesn't mean that they're in a minority. Um, the UK and Ireland and Western Europe generally have not signed up to this convention. But it is of interest here because the allegations of mistreatment of migrant workers in the building of the stadiums all point to a contravention of a number of articles within the convention, including those that relate to the rights of workers to leave the country, the prohibiting or withholding or destroying of passports and so on. 
This leads on to issues of modern slavery. Now, we do have um, UK legislation on this in the form of the 2014 Modern Slavery Act, which we can link um, for anyone that's interested in this um, after when the, prod- when the podcast is broadcast. But it also raises some issues as to the voluntary aspect of employment in itself. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, this is kind of, it's the interesting thing about the study of law is uh, at the background here, we have real people we have real situations um, and um, and profound social problems. You know, we all supply labour involuntarily to an extent because um, uh, because we need to feed our families, we need to um, earn money. But the parameters of what it is to supply labour voluntarily are, of course, very, very different uh, in um, different environments and indeed not just in different jurisdictions, but within jurisdictions in different situations. You know, um, those of us who are relatively privileged have stable contracts that we can, you know, supply notice on and, and go elsewhere um, are, I think, by any reasonable measure, uh, supplying our labour voluntarily. But construction workers in Qatar, for instance, you know, they're supplying their labour, they're under a contract, they're getting paid to an extent, although there are big problems of trafficking fees there. Um, but uh, fundamentally, when the contract comes to an end, they're going to be deported. And so that that raises issues around how voluntary this yeah. is. Yeah, I would just, um, I suppose, maybe question the simplicity maybe of the fact that they, that they are just deported. Um, I, again, going back to Human Rights Watch and uh, one of their reports, um, they reported that whenever they tried to interview workers in Qatar, um, they they found it almost impossible to actually access or get information from the workers, um, and in fact, where in in one of the sites they were able to speak to a Nepalese construction worker, and he answered the questions, and he answered the questions truthfully. Um, the consequence of that was that he was fired um, and he was then ordered to get back on the plane um, to Nepal, which, as you say, um, should have been a straightforward um, deportation. However, um, along the way, somebody realised that uh, this worker uh, no longer has a work sponsor and therefore he is there illegally and so he was thrown in jail because of that. So the workers aren't just facing um, deportation, they're actually um, facing being put into jail. Um, Also, whenever we're talking um, about them arriving in the first place, they're told that they have almost like administration fees that are going to be the equivalent of maybe $200. And then they find that whenever they arrive in Qatar, that these administration fees are like $2,000 plus. And so um, they, at the very outset, are owing their employees maybe two years worth of wages. Um, and so you combine all of these factors where they're in debt to their employers, they're, um, they face being put into jail if they're fired, um, never mind simply being put back in a plane, put on a plane rather to their home country, which in some circumstances might actually be a relief to the workers. Um, they face outrageous consequences um, if they in any way try to stand up for their situation. So I think that it, that it is right to say that this is modern slavery that's taking place in these construction sites. Would you agree? Well, or? well I think what's really interesting here as well is this just highlights the degree to which a labour market isn't simply about private agents contracting with each other. The employer is resting on the power of the state to enforce a certain kind of relationship and power dynamic with their workers, as they do in any labour contract. But in these situations, you can see that the, the, the power of the state to imprison, to deport and all that has been used as leverage, in a sense, to exploit workers. Um, that's a really interesting. I, I hadn't known about, about the person being um, imprisoned. I mean, I, for, for me, I, I'm really quite interested in, in corporate language around uh, human rights and how corporations, kind of through their boilerplate um, uh, in their reports, talk about human rights. But the thing that really comes up again and again and again when we look at these reports, when we talk about it, is the question of complicity. You know, we have to remember that FIFA, that sponsors, you know, for the most part, with the exception of, uh, certainly when we talked about, about stadium construction, construction, are not commissioning human rights abuses themselves. They're not the active commissioners of human rights abuses. Um, they're the beneficiaries of human rights abuses, you know, and this, I think, runs through when we're interested in supply chains, we're interested in corporate language, we're interested in human rights, the, the question of business and human rights, which is, 
not um, uh, commissioning, but uh, either pro- providing assistance or encouragement or simply being the beneficiary of abuses. You know, and um, this is where uh, we really need to, to focus. And actually, I, I think there's there's another element to that uh, linked into global supply chain. So you see in the in the guiding principles a relatively simple discussion of there's a danger of complicity. The solution is due diligence, is to to audit your supply chain to ensure that there are no human rights abuses going on. But we really need to think about distance. You know, not geographical distance, but although that too, but but kind of conceptual distance. What we're talking about here is contractors or subcontractors mm-hmm. engaging labour in a highly exploitative manner. Um, with state support, at least implicit state support, to build a stadium. They've been commissioned, the stadium construction has been commissioned by states that themselves have been, in effect, commissioned by FIFA to do this. And FIFA itself is generating revenue as um, as a provider of reputational services to sponsors and entertainment services to TV companies. And ultimately then, we the consumer of uh, of the sponsored products of the brands or of um, the entertainment themselves uh, are benefiting. You know, there is a line of beneficiaries there that come back to us. You know, we're wearing the consequences of um, of these abuses. So I think there's there's profound philosophical questions here about about how law manages questions of responsibility and complicity. That's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, it really is. But I think that coming on from that as well, 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 so what? You know, what happens? How are FIFA dealing with these issues? Are they providing any route to remedy for anybody that can accuse an organisation somewhere along that supply chain of an abuse of their human rights? Um, so, so what is to be done? Yes, fact? yes. Now, if you remember back, to maybe halfway through this this podcast, we mentioned that there exists this United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And one aspect of it was the need to provide a remedy where there has been a human rights violation. And we did mention that FIFA actually was using the language of these guiding principles. Now, if you look at the advisory reports that FIFA submit, um, they do say that they are going to provide a remedy. But if you look into that in a bit more detail, they are speaking about engaging with trade unions primarily and facilitating or providing alternative dispute resolution. And just thinking in the context of our discussion this morning, um, this isn't good enough. Do those migrant workers have membership off or any real access to a trade union? So quite simply, the FIFA committee or the FIFA commitment, sorry, to remedy does not go far enough. It seems to be a way of paying lip service to the language of international human rights law and specifically to these guiding principles. But really, it is the victims of those violations, such as the migrant workers and such as those um working in the sweatshops in Eastern Asia that are actually losing out. Maybe, Kieran, you'd want to well, jump uh, in on this. Well, one of the things that, that I think is, is really interesting about all of these proclamations about uh, human rights by, by global organisations, of which FIFA is one, is who is the audience? You know, who is the audience yeah. for this? So, I, I mean, when we think about, you know, banks, global banks talking about um, their corporate social responsibility, the audience, certainly after the financial crisis, is their home states, you know, and they're trying to convince their home states, don't regulate us. We have it sorted. We have it under control. You know, mining companies are talking to home states, but also to NGOs. But who is who is FIFA's audience here? If they're talking to you know, largely European um, and to an extent also North American trade unions about human rights abuses and they're not actually talking to the victims of those abuses or to those who have agency in, in those spheres. Um, who is the audience? I can only presume that the audience is us. And still, I really do think it's important that we note that the language of human rights is being engaged with, is being developed in concert with business, this is one of the most important things I think about the um, the guiding principles is how they've found the authors and architects. The guiding principles have found a way to draw business in um, and organisations into talking about them. Indeed, FIFA themselves, when they're developing their approach to human rights, uh, drafted in John Ruggie, who was the primary kind of individual architect of the guiding principles to um, help them develop a language around human rights and approach to human rights and proactivity around human rights. But I suppose the question really comes down to, is this enough? 
Yeah, um, I wonder though, is there actually a deeper question, Kieran, that we need to um, address? And that is, can we rely on the law? Can we rely on the law and the instruments of the law? Or are they complicit in um, covering political failure here? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're right. You're right. Law can only go far. And I think, you know, there's a temptation, I suppose, especially amongst us who study the law, to think that law is, is the route to solving social problems. But, of course, a lot of this is coming down to state decision making and to, to political failure. I would say, you know, whatever the reason, you know, that um, these failings have come to the fore now, maybe they were just so obvious when it came to construction problems in, in Qatar, for instance. Maybe it came down to a sense in the United States that the World Cup had effectively been stolen off them. Uh, um, but they are at the fore. Rights now are at the fore now. It, it's quite striking that rights can become salient, maybe not because of the abuses that are then exposed, but for other reasons. Still, they, they are salient now. You know, we know, we, we can't not know about the relationship between rights abuses and global sporting and entertainment events. Um, I would say, you know, businesses especially and states as we see uh, through, through the World Cup uh, and other places need reputation. They have a drive uh, towards um, being seen as as broadly virtuous in the eyes of others. So there's a there's an opportunity for for us who are interested in human rights to kind of take this moment uh, and keep the pressure on and build the pressure and maybe restore a sense of rights as being the core driver of um, of modern statehood uh, back onto centre stage. That's great. Um, I think this has been um, quite a worthwhile conversation to have, um, looking at the intersections of business, World Cup and human rights. Um, thank you very much, Kieran. Thank you. And thank you very much, Kira. Thanks very much. You've been listening to Law Pod, an informed take on current events brought to you by law students and staff at Queen's University Belfast. This episode was produced by Richard Somerville, Rachel Colleen, Claire Patton, Kieran Kelly and Kira Haggett. LawPod is funded by Queen's Law School and the Queen's Annual Fund. You can follow us on Twitter at QUB LawPod, and for more information, you can also visit our website, lawpod.org. And please have a look in the show notes for more information about the topics covered today. You can also find us on iTunes or anywhere else that you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. I am Claire, and this was LawPod. <laughs>